Welcome to Quest for Peace. I'm Ayaz Akhtar. And, uh, well, if you've never seen this show, again, I don't know how you're seeing it now, but if you are watching it, uh, this show kind of centers around me because I got problems, people. Uh, I've been trying to figure out how to be centered, have some kind of inner peace for several years now. It's probably now I'm reaching years six or seven on this quest. And I know that sounds a little dumb. Like, oh, it's taking you seven years and you're not finding peace. What does that mean? For me, it's about being kind of like calm and not freaking out and not really allowing myself to obsess over stuff that doesn't matter. And I am really good at, a, at obsessing about crap that doesn't matter. And I want to make sure that I can handle what I need to handle because I have a very young son. He's going to be five now, so not that young anymore. But I want to make sure that I can give him an insight to go, hey, you know why you get so obsessed? I know what that was like. I can tell you exactly what that's like because I do see a lot of uh, my tendencies in him. He's got a super intense face like me. So I'm like, son, if you look like that, people will think you're pissed off. So anyway, today we have a guest and you might know him from lots of places. You might know him from this network too, a GFQ network for podcast uh, pretense. We've got the one, the only Jonathan Strickland on right now with the keyboard. That's not working. Go for it. It's my intense face. That's your intense face. I know that's about as bad as it gets, right? That was seriously, hey guys. seriously intense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I am uh, pleased to be here and to help you on your journey to peace. Namaste. So, Jonathan, if nobody knows you, which is such a load of garbage, if nobody knows yeah. you, how it happens pretty frequently. <laughs> can you introduce yourself to the uh, viewing and listening audience? Sure. Uh, Jonathan Strickland. I have been working at How Stuff Works since 2007. And uh, I generally, well, I used to write articles for How Stuff Works, like like how the Large Hadron Collider works or um, how Asimo works, that kind of stuff. And then over the past couple of years, I've transitioned into doing more uh, podcasts and videos exclusively as my job. So I do a series called Forward Thinking that's an optimistic view of the possibilities of the future. It covers everything from tech to science to culture to pretty much anything you can think of. Uh, I do a show called Tech Stuff, which I've done since 2008, which is all about technology. Iaz has been on that show a couple of times. Uh, I am also a host on a couple of other shows, Brain Stuff and What the Stuff. So uh, a lot of stuff shows at HowStuffWorks.com. And uh, yeah, that's what I do for a living. On In my spare time, I tend to do more writing and some acting and performing and things like that. So that that's me in a nutshell. Oh, and I'm also I'm a I'm a married dude with a dog. Yeah, we were joking before we started this episode how uh, a lot of the folks that I talk to are uh, they they have no kids, have a beard, and have dogs. That I fit all three of those criteria. I said a lot of people. I, if, if, you, if you guys aren't aware, uh, my significant other Elizabeth Romero is over right across from me right now you can't see her and she's like because she was on a previous episode that we recorded today and she's like i don't have a beard so well there you go sorry but we, we do have dogs yeah and you're very successful anyway uh I, i'm relatively successful i i think that um one of the things that i find important about uh being happy is always trying to find new ways to stretch myself right to to try and do something new, giving myself, uh, actually a risk of failure tends to help too, because without the risk, I, I just end up feeling like I'm not achieving anything. And then I start getting antsy and I get less happy. So that's one of the things right off the bat. I like, I like to think of myself as successful, but I like to think that I can always achieve more. Are you a goal based person? Because I, I, I used to be in the, the, for the most part, once I get that goal though, I had no idea once what to do with it. Like, I, Oh, I really want this dream. And then I get it. And then I'm like, yeah, what do I do now? Cause I didn't plan for that. The journey is supposed to be its own reward, but I didn't know that for the longest time. And I think for me, I have figured that out that I do like being, this is an odd thing to say. I like to be nervous and I like the option of failing when I do something because then I'm going to learn. I really like learning if it turns right. out. Uh, what, what about you? Are you goal-based or are you, are you good with the journey? I like the journey as well. I mean, I, there, there are definitely times when I have a specific goal in mind and I really want to achieve it. And I'm very disappointed if I don't achieve that. However, I try to keep in mind the idea that failure does teach us more than success does. 
if you are if you set out to do something and you're successful the first time you do it, you didn't really learn anything. It's essentially the thing you picked ended up working just fine and you go on from there. When you fail, you start to learn. You're able to incorporate that in your future attempts. So failure is something that I think uh, uh, you know needs to be understood better by people in general. Just the idea that you know people say failure is not an option or I don't want to fail. Uh, you know, of course we don't want to fail, but we shouldn't be afraid of it either because failure is not the end of the world. It is a way for us to learn more about ourselves and about the processes that we're employing to do whatever it is to try and achieve a goal. And through that, we can actually grow as people. I don't think you really grow so much if every time you try and do something, you're succeeding. It's There's no growth there. Yeah, and I'm going to sound like a braggart. Usually when I go ahead and try to do something, I end up getting it. And it's really weird because then you're like, what's the point? I had to look this up and this is going to, this is part of my, my mental problems when it comes to handling this stuff. When you know you can do stuff and you can succeed at it, to me, it's actually a demotivator. Yeah. I, had a, I was looking it up to see if anybody else had this and I found like one bizarre Reddit thread. And that's the only thing I've seen with somebody who, if they are capable of succeeding, finding to be not motivational to continue to do something, which I sound, it sounds just kind of problematic. What, what are you, you're a smart guy. What the hell does that sound like to you? Uh, to me, it sounds like what it was like for me in high school, where uh, high school was incredibly easy for me with one class exception that I can think of, which was calculus, and uh, which I just I, it didn't it didn't click with me. But everything else like algebra, trigonometry, geometry, sciences, all of that stuff just it made sense to me. And uh, I ended up coasting like I, I could have. I could have been at least I probably could have been the valedictorian in my high school class, but I wasn't because I, I didn't have any motivation to push myself. I was, you know, I was like, ah, I'm good enough. I can, I understand this enough to do really well, get like a minuses on tests, things like that. Not, not at the, the level that the people who were actually motivated to do well, they were performing at a higher level than I was. I don't think they were necessarily smarter than I was, but they were certainly more motivated. And, I think part of it was that I just got complacent because nothing was difficult for me. So I, I didn't end up caring very much. Um, and the same sort of thing can happen in professional life too. I mean, there were times when I got a, an article assignment. It's, it's really weird. I would get article assignments where there would be a, uh, an assignment I really thought would be interesting. I was really interested in the topic and it ended up being very difficult for me to write because of one reason or another, I guess really it was just, again, a, a question of motivation was that I, I, I felt like I knew so much about it and I just didn't know where to start. And it was always the, the topics that I didn't find interesting at first where I didn't know very much. And I, I didn't really think much about it until I started researching it. And because I had to learn, it ended up being much more interesting to me. And then I found a lot more satisfaction writing those articles. They were easier to write ultimately because I was doing so much research and formulating my thoughts and trying to get them down. Uh, and I felt a real sense of accomplishment for it. So eventually I got to the point where I just sort of, I, I, I was able to kind of get rid of that, that mentality of complacency. Um, that's a real happiness killer. I mean, you just start like you, you just don't want to do anything. You just, you know, you got to what you need to do is you have to find three factors, really, in order to um, to to do to, to make yourself do something. You need motivation. You need the ability to do whatever it is you're trying to do. And you need a trigger that is going to be the element that pushes you to do that behavior. This is based off a behavioral model that a guy named B.J. Fogg created. Um, he, he has a, a persuasive tech lab, which sounds really kind of science fiction-y, but it's all about coming up with methodologies for people to try and change behaviors. And it can either be to start a new behavior or increase an existing behavior or to stop a destructive behavior. And uh, I think the behavioral model makes a lot of sense. This idea that, you know, you have to find the right balance between your ability to do something because if it's too hard to do, no amount of motivation is ever going to let you succeed at that task. 
Um, if it's incredibly easy, you might not need a lot of motivation to do it, but you still need the trigger to push you over to the, to, to actually act. And, uh, this is incredibly important if you're trying to do a long term change in your behavior. And I just recently learned about this behavioral model because I did an episode of forward thinking about, um, in the future, will we have ways to either modify behavior or influence behavior in such a way to make the world potentially a better place? Because that's an element in science fiction where often that's taken to a very dark place, the manipulation of human behavior for the benefit of a corporation or a, a state government. But I was wondering if there were ways where we might be able to improve the world in such a, a fashion that it would encourage ethical behaviors from people without forcing them into it. It's just that the world itself is in a better place and therefore ethical behavior ends up being the, uh, the go-to choice. So I, fell, I found the behavioral model when I was doing my research there. And it's really interesting to me. I, I the, continuing to look into it further so that way I can help myself work on either increasing behaviors I feel like I want to do more of or, or getting rid of ones in the, in the future. Yeah. When it comes to behavior modification, just reminded me back uh, when I was learning about tax law, just regular law in general, that there are all these rules that are set up to incentivize behaviors. It's like one of the reasons why uh, mortgage payments are deductible versus a rent. I mean, it's the same thing. You're living somewhere, right? Well, shouldn't one be, shouldn't they be the same? It's like, no, the government actually wants to encourage ownership of properties. They want you to take care of things. That's why the landlord gets their deduction for their, mor uh, their mortgage, et cetera. Um, this idea that we would all act in a, in a common interest, as ethical as that would be, I don't know how simple that would be. I was looking into, yeah. uh, you ever heard of cognitive behavior therapy? It's basically... I, I've heard, like, yeah, I've heard the term. I'm not really familiar. Can you uh, define it for me? Well, it's really about the way you process information, right? So let's say you and I uh, were going to uh, catch a train, right? So we're going to mm -hmm. go to this train and I just run in and you get to miss it. So it's all about, actually, we both run up to the train. Let's both miss this train. Now I can go, this is the worst thing that's happened to me. And you could just be like, wait a second, we just missed that train. The next train is coming. So you, it's basically how you process the stimuli mm -hmm. before you make your reaction. And a lot of people have this tendency to go, well, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to me versus mm -hmm. going like, well, this will be fine. Uh, I was just reading about this. And the oddball thing is, this is another thing I read on Reddit. And then I ended up getting, uh, I didn't buy the book yet. I actually looked at the sample. It was surprisingly a wrestling thing. It was about Daniel Bryan. You know about Daniel okay. Bryan. Okay, yeah, uh, yes, if you yes, guys, yes. If you guys listening to this aren't into wrestling, and if you're a GFQ network, you probably are into wrestling. Uh, but Daniel Bryan did an interview with Chris Jericho. Daniel Bryan is a, that's his stage name. His name is Bryan Danielson. This guy was so beloved by fans that the main event of WrestleMania 30 had to be rewritten to bring him into the main event to have him win. So it's such a crazy idea. And the next year... He was involved in the first match on the card. He was no longer world champion. And so in this interview, he is talking about how his experiences were, uh, everything is lucky. He thought he was successful when he had his first wrestling match, when he got into wrestling school, when he got to WWE. He was ex excited for each opportunity as opposed to going, okay, well, this sucks. Now I was at the main event at WrestleMania 30. Now next year, I'm in this first, first match. And the way he put it, he was excited to give opportunity to a level of, of wrestlers, mid-carters, so they, he'd have more guys to work with. Now, they, he can wrestle anybody, and they can wrestle him, and it's going to create this. And somebody likened this to cognitive behavior therapy, that this guy, mm. Daniel Bryan, uh, he naturally chooses to react positively to these stimuli. Because a lot of people get very bitter and go, to hell with this. This is horrible. Yeah, it, it's one of those things I try to do. I mean... I I'm human. So there are times when I fail at this as well, but there are times where, uh, I try very hard to think that in that sort of sense, like anything that's a setback is not a huge deal. Most of the time it's often very temporary. And, uh, ultimately you might end up having a greater success despite or because of that setback. 
So I try to keep that in mind. It's the same sort of thing where I try to keep it in mind that people other than myself have uh, various things going on in their lives and motivations where maybe their actions impact me negatively for a short amount of time. I'm thinking like, here's a very simple uh, example. Like if you're going through traffic and someone does something in traffic that you think was like incredibly dumb, that's a very frustrating experience that I think a lot of people can relate to. But at the same time, you don't really know what was going on with the person who was driving, whether it was a conscious decision on their part to do something that was going to impact you negatively, whether they are, uh, you know, stressing out themselves and attempting to try and get to from point A to point B, you just don't know. So I try to keep in mind that as well. The idea that there are a lot of, you know, everyone on earth has got their own motivations, fears, their goals, their anxieties. And I can't just interpret any, get any given action as being directed at me. <laughs> this is where you try to get out of the egocentric model of the universe and say, all right, you know, I realize that this thing that happened to me as a re result of someone else's actions is, is not cool. It's negative, but without knowing exactly what was going on with the other person, I can't even be certain that it was a conscious decision for them to impact me, let alone, you know, actually directed at me. It could have been that it was just a consequence and letting go of that stuff, I think, helps a lot, too. It's one of those things that uh, in this case, I wrote um, how road rage works. And let me tell you, if you want to have a really like like upsetting experience, you just start researching road rage and really seriously looking into statistics and uh, looking at at police reports and things of that nature, traffic reports, um, you realize that that these little interactions can escalate so quickly that it takes, it, it does take effort for you to step back and say, this really wasn't about me. It might've impacted me, but it wasn't about me. And once you get to that, you can start to let go of things. It's kind of similar in that respect of things that look like setbacks may not, they may not really be that. That's just your interpretation of the event and you can work around that. Now, like, what methodology do you have when it comes to letting things go? Because I have to go through a lot of mental gymnastics to go, it's not worth it. It's really not worth it. I mean, it's much faster than it used to be. Like, I would have to take myself yeah. aside, maybe something that really bothered me. I'd have to, like, sit alone by myself for, like, 20 minutes. And that would take a long time to get, get over that stuff. Now I'm a little faster. What, what mm -hmm. do you find that you do? I, I usually try and put myself in the place of, of other people. Like if it's, if it's something that's, that's a, a sequence of events that was initiated by another person, I try to put myself in that person's place and say, what are the, what are the kind of situations where I would have made that same decision? Knowing that in the past I have certainly done things that have negatively impacted other people. And that was not my intention. I try in general to be a good person. Uh, and so I know that in my past I've done something unthinkingly that has negatively impacted someone. So I try to put myself in that position, kind of empathize with the person. And uh, more often than not, I, I see I'm like, you know, don't blame that person. Don't get upset. Let it go. It's not going to do any good to be upset about it because you can't change what has happened. Uh, you can just you can just try and make sure you can move on. In the rare instance where you realize like, oh, no, that person has really kind of um, kind of screwed me over or whatever, then you you have a conversation ahead of you or you have to figure out how to deal with that. That's something that you don't necessarily just let go because then you think, well, now I need to make sure I don't put myself in that position again if that's possible or maybe even bring this up. If it's a, if it's someone with whom I have a relationship where I can have that kind of conversation, uh, it's a little trickier, but 99% of the time, it's a completely kind of unintended consequence situation. And once you get to that, you realize, all right, you know, maybe they weren't be taking as much care as they needed to. Maybe they weren't as aware of the situation. Maybe even that I could bring up at some point, but ultimately knowing it wasn't an intended, uh, consequence, I can, I can at least be sure that someone's not out to make my life miserable. It's just a, an uninfor unfortunate event that I can let go of. Um, that's generally what I do, uh, or try to do. Like I said, there's, there are times like there are 
there are days where maybe I haven't had enough sleep and maybe I haven't uh, exercised for a couple of days and I get really cranky and grouchy that I don't let go of it. And ultimately later on, I just think, well, I kind of escalated the amount of stress I was experiencing. And a lot of that was due to the way I reacted. Yeah. I was just thinking a lot of the, uh, the good things that happened in my life are based on inaction. Like don't <laughs> voice something. Don't do this <laughs> thing that you want to do. Like just whatever you're thinking right now, if you just put it aside for like 10 minutes it probably didn't matter in the first place, so maybe if yeah. you just let it go, it won't it won't happen that way. I found that to be, it works at at, at, at work just fine, right? You go into a, a place of business. If somebody says something that you didn't particularly like, you don't start like telling them everything on your mind, right? Yeah, this is a um, my well. First of all, I was brought up in the South, and in the South we have this very non confrontational approach to things. We tend to, if you're talking badly about someone, I guarantee that someone's not in the room or at least not in earshot. Uh, we'll talk badly about you behind your back, but not to your face, sweetheart. Just come on in, sit down, have some iced tea. Um, we are very non confrontational, which is not necessarily healthy, uh, depending upon the situation. But it does mean that uh, I often want to avoid that sort of thing. I will bring things up. Um, there was a great example just last night, actually. It was crazy. Uh, my wife and I went and had um, breakfast at one restaurant and had been um, overlooked for a while before someone came to uh, see us. But they they apologized profusely and even gave us free desserts for it. And we hadn't been waiting that long. But then last night we went to dinner and we got overlooked again, two times in one day. And uh, and this time we were a little more irritated because it was the second time that it happened that day. And so uh, in that case, I got, you know, we got up and, and mentioned to the hostess, I was like, I'm sorry, uh, no one's come by to see us at all. We don't have water. We haven't, no one's talked to us. Uh, but I, we took a very polite approach to it. Uh, there was a time where either I would be taking the passive aggressive approach where I just cross my arms in front of me and get a glowering look on my face as I wait and wait and wait for someone to show up, or I would have been rude. Um, and I'm glad that I'm no longer at those, those places, even though this yesterday was pretty rough. It was, it was pushing me toward bad behavior just because it was the second time that happened in a day. And that was enough to, to really irritate me. But, uh, yeah, I, I find that taking that time, before you respond and making, making sure you, you realize that, uh, you know, again, it wasn't that someone was ignoring me. It was just one of those days where something's really busy and people don't notice them there. There's not a miscommunication that stuff happens. I mean, I, I'm, I've been the cause of it enough times. And if everyone reacted to me in a super negative way, I'd probably never leave the house. I would just be cowed into not interacting with people. That sounds like a new series waiting for you. That, that stuff happens. It's just like and that happened to uh, uh, Liz and I went out for breakfast and it seemed like we were being overlooked to be seated. And they're like, oh, we'll get back to you. And then didn't get back to us for a while. And, and then I looked at the wa my watch. I'm like, it's only been six minutes. So it really yeah. hasn't been that long a time, but it feels like forever because I was hungry. And we're like, why are we still here? And that happened at another restaurant. And we're just like, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to game the system. We're going to know the name of the waiter that we like. And we're going to ask to be seated in his section from now on. So yeah. if you're in New York City, AG Kitchen, ask for Alberto. That dude <laughs> is the best waiter. Everybody else seems to like not look at you, refuses to say they don't, they've done something wrong or got your order wrong. But this dude knows what he's doing. So we've done this, even though it seems super awkward, this idea of introducing yourself to the, to the, to the staff, because you, where we, it's, this is around where we live. So the idea is that we're going to be in here regularly. So... Let's get this going. Um, I, I don't know if I can handle the being ignored thing because it would drive me crazy being ignored in any respect for me as I'm talking in a microphone with a camera on me. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> what could possibly yeah, be wrong we, with we me? We seek out opportunities to have focus directed at us entirely. Uh, being ignored is like a, a major pet peeve. Um, yeah, I, I, I did the same thing as you did with the the finding the waiter that your weight person that you like and, and requesting to be seated in their their uh, section. I'll never forget 
when my wife and I went to a, a local restaurant here in Atlanta, we asked to be seated in our favorite waiter's section, and they told us that he had left, and we were devastated because uh, uh, he just went above and beyond and was awesome, and we would always get seated right away by by asking to be in his section. Um, so yeah, but that does work. It's a good it's a good key. You know, people remember that you're there. Um, but uh, ultimately, again, I think empathy is a big deal. I think I, I've been kind of on an empathy and compassion kick for the last couple of years, particularly as I observe behaviors in subcultures that I find really upsetting things like, uh, the, um, the, the treatment of women in lots, well, pretty much everywhere, but specifically I I'm part of the skeptical community, although more of a, I'm, I don't tend to take an active role apart from I, I stress the importance of critical thinking in my work at how stuff works, but I, I do follow it. And I saw there was a really probably about four or five years ago, there was a real nasty kind of upwelling of misogynist behavior that I was completely unaware of mostly because I'm not a woman uh, within the skeptical community. And then of course, recently we've seen that again in the video game industry. And that's something that, you know, you could argue it's been there all the whole time, but the attention has really been turned up on it over the last, I don't know, 16 months or so. And, uh, and it's, it's in those realms where I try to stress that <clears throat> empathy and compassion are the ways for you to understand other people and to care about, how they are perceiving the world, how their interactions are are moving forward. And that, you know, as someone who doesn't want to have negative inter interactions personally, I, I really advocate that folks think about that so that they don't end up impacting someone else's life in a negative way. And I find that gives me a lot of happiness too, especially on the rare occasions where it seems to actually connect with people. Um, cause some people, you know, obviously they're in a, they have their own worldview that they have constructed and it's very hard for you to change someone's worldview. Really, they have to want to change it. You just have to be able to give enough examples and, and serve as an example to, uh, to hope to make a positive impact. And that's kind of been my goal for the last two or three years, really, uh, I started to very much take seriously the idea of making a positive impact. The The end goal being I want the world to be at least a slightly better place than it was before I was here. Right, because normally you are, you know, setting things on fire and tipping over cars. It is a no Well, that, that, that was, you know, five years ago, sure. That was a different yeah. goal. The goal was to tip over cars. Mm -hmm. No, but you, you talk about empathy, but seriously, like I really suck at empathy. Okay. I am very bad at putting myself in, and, and not the pe a person's shoes. I mean, I'm actually decent at it with my son, which is an oddball thing. Like I understand what it is to not be understood. I'm like, okay, listen, mm -hmm. this kid has a limited vocabulary. He's trying to explain something to me and whatever's going on, he can't necessarily say it in an elegant way. That's just like me still. So I have a hard time explaining what's going on in my brain at times because like it's so uh, natural. Like, of course, this is the way I think. Of course. So like I, I used to get in a lot of trouble in law school. They'd be say, Mr. Actor, are you too conclusory? Meaning I always would not back up what I was saying. I'm like, well, it's obvious why I'm saying this, right? You obviously know this. But they're like, you need to write this out because that's why you're here. So I got really good at writing based on that, at least in law school writing, not real writing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have the hardest time trying to get people to understand what I am thinking. So I have a hard time going, well, what makes you tick? Because if they can't understand me, I, this is sound horrible. I'm a horrible person. I don't want to bother to learn what they're thinking because they're behind me by like whatever amount. How, how did you find this, this empathy? Well, it's, it's just, you, you know, you realize that we all have the same basic motivations. The, the only difference is in the details, but the basic motivations remain the same for everyone. Uh, and, you know, there are times where those motivations might also include some things that are of a very different philosophical point of view than your own. 
And that could be due to anything. It could be due to the background of the person, you know, their childhood, how they were brought up. It could be the culture that they are from. Uh, It could be from negative or positive experiences that they've had in their past. All of that stuff shapes us. But you know that ultimately, deep down, everyone has the same sort of basic motivations. We're all we're all human beings, and uh, while those those specifics are going to be very different in a case by case basis, ultimately it all comes from the same source. So once you get to that, then you start saying, "All right, now I realize there are going to be differences between this person and me. Do those differences matter? Sometimes they are going to matter." Because sometimes they're going to be so – the differences are going to be so vast that finding a common connection is going to be difficult if not impossible. That will happen. But most of the time, you're going to find that there's going to be a lot of ways to kind of connect to that person in a way that is at least a little meaningful. And uh, that's ultimately where I, I try to go with this. Knowing that if I encounter somebody who's had a drastically different background – and situation, especially considering, I mean, I'm a white guy. I'm in the most privileged class in in the United States, uh, you know, and I, I'm not I'm not to the point where I'm old enough where I'd be in the the slightly less privileged class of like senior citizen. I'm not there, so I'm about as high up on the peak as I can get. Keeping that in mind and knowing that other people I encounter may be in vastly different circumstances helps as as well. So, uh, I mean, you, again, you, you look at, you look at the fact that we're all coming from the same basic place. You realize that there are going to be differences, but that doesn't change the fact that this is a person who has his or her own desires, his or her own fears. The there's stuff that keeps that person up at night that, they are genuinely worried about. And it might be something that in your life would be a non-factor, but to them is genuinely a concern. Knowing that and realizing that and thinking, okay, a lot of the behaviors that, that we're seeing could be motivated by factors I am unaware of helps me because I, I realize that I don't want to just go ahead and uh, and and assume that they have a specific motivation because I don't know their full story. And I know that there have been times in my life where because of all the different factors that were coming together, I was behaving in a way that was probably not healthy and certainly not, not in a compassionate and em- empathetic way. So that's – a lot of it also I think for me personally was just growing up, you know, getting more mature – that level of maturity, I think, helped me understand, oh, wait, other people go through the same thing I'm going through right now. It might be from other uh, stimuli, but it's the same feeling. And that has sort of mellowed me out and helped me try to understand people or at least empathize with them uh, more frequently. Yeah, it's funny because I've known you for a couple of years and I never would think of you as somebody who had – uh, an issue relating to people or, uh, I mean, you, you, you understand me, which is very unusual. <laughs> so, uh, because of that, I never thought of you that way, but it's interesting to hear that because it's, it reminds me of like how everyone, when they grow up, there's this period where you go, Oh, mom and dad are people. And then yeah. you realize that they have worries, concerns, and they have their own set of issues. And, and you, you just have a different perspective because before they were like super mom or su- super woman, super uh, man, that's what they were. They were these super people. And yep. they could do no wrong or whatever it would be. Or they're just clueless people who know nothing because, you know, you're a teenager or whatever it is. But eventually it clicks. And I've been looking for that click moment for a while. Like, am I going to relate to people? And I'm getting there. I mean, if people, you, you know, I, I've mellowed out. You, I'm like, you remember the noodles thing. So I have yes, mellowed I out. But that was all. <laughs> uh, anyway. Wait, wait. I got I to gotta explain what the noodles thing is. We were in Las Vegas for CES and a group of us were trying to figure out where we wanted to eat. And one person had suggested a restaurant that served, uh, you know, noodle dishes, an Asian restaurant. And uh, I, as for reasons unbeknownst to the rest of us, very firmly and vehemently said he would under no circumstances go eat at noodles. Yeah, the censored version was like, I don't want any effing noodles. 
That's which ended ended up making us joke about noodles for the approximately the next six hours. <laughs> now we're six hours, but to this day we still talk That's about true. it. That's true. And and d- to explain that, I was sleep deprived. Very, very yeah. sleep deprived. And you were sleep very deprived. Hungry. And but yes, exactly. We you, didn't know each other. Blood very sugar well. was your blood sugar was low. You were sleep deprived. I thought it was funny. You didn't upset me. <laughs> I thought it was amusing. I mean, I, at the same time, I was like, uh, you know, I was going to rib you a little bit, but I wasn't going to go too far because, again, we didn't know each other well enough where I was going to really turn up the the scorn or anything. But you know, it's. Uh, I, I think for me, honestly, you know, it sounds like like. You know, I'm I'm the whole compassion, peace, love, understanding guru here. But honestly, the the real eye opener for me, and it's I, I'm I'm almost ashamed to admit it, would be from like five or six years ago when I started paying attention to the the uh, the the stories coming out of the skeptical community about how women were being treated at these events because. This is a group of people who are supposed to be applying critical thinking and rationality. You would assume that such people would uh, would go ahead and and just reach the conclusion, oh, women and men are both human beings. They are both capable of great things and terrible things. There's no difference there as far as their capability of these things. But it seemed like it seemed like it was really prevalent. Like there was a lot of mansplaining going on. Like the men, they're rational. They know how things work. They know science. Women might be interested, but they can't know it. That seemed to be the implied message being given off. And the more I was, the more I became aware of it, the more I got upset. And I think that's where I really had the final click, right? This click we're talking about where we realize what's going on. And, and again, part of the problem for me was coming from the place of privilege. It's very hard for me to, to see the challenges other people face because I don't face those challenges, at least not based upon my skin color. So it's one of those things where you really have to take yourself out of yourself and, and, and think, well, if I were in this position, how would I feel? And then when you start realizing how far that extends well beyond this one community where it should certainly not exist, but it, 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 goes across everything. It was a real eye opening moment for me. And I'm almost, like I said, I'm almost ashamed of it because it's, it seems now in retrospect, so evident that I can't imagine how it was. I went so long without recognizing it. Uh, and I, I tend to be kind of hard on myself for that. But the most important thing is not to punish myself for not realizing it earlier, but rather to attempt to convey these thoughts going forward into the future and stressing the importance of things like empathy and compassion and rationality and fairness. These ideas that seem really evident to me from the beginning, but only because I was of a class that we got that by default. Yeah. I was thinking about the closest thing I've had to like empathy and, and it was a, I think it was a Richard Carlson book. And the idea was when you talk to people no matter who they are, just imagine that everybody but you is enlightened. Like they know something you don't. So mm-hmm. listen to them and give them a chance instead of going like, oh, I'm not listening to this guy. He doesn't know what he's doing. Yeah. I'm not listening to this, this lady. Ah, she doesn't know what she's talking about. Just go, okay, what are they trying to get across? Mm-hmm. And if you actually do listen with a critical ear, I mean, you might find out that somebody's an idiot. Okay, but that, yeah. that's, that's, that's beside the point. But there might be something that they understand that you just will never comprehend. And to... to even allow yourself that mentality when it comes to other people can be very helpful, at least in my, in my experience it's been. So that way I'm not flipping out constantly. Uh, it, I flip it's, out a lot it's less. Also, it's also really challenging sometimes. I mean, it really can be like if I, uh, if I'm in a group of friends who have very different political views than mine, uh, I, I fall into those same traps as everybody else. I mean, I fall into the same trap of, of dismissing ideas out of hand or, even just dismissing a person's opinions about everything just because they happen to disagree with me on a certain uh, point. And, and that's, you know, it's a human thing. And I try to, I try to avoid doing it, but I still do it because it's hard. Um, You know, it's obviously it's going to be a lot easier when you're with people who have the same general belief system that you have. 
And when you're uh, in a different group, it's going to be more challenging. So the, the real uh, trick there is to try and employ those same, those same skills that, that are easy to do with your group of peers when you happen to be with a group of other people. And th you, can, you can at least hope that they're doing the same for you. It's not always the case, but you can at least hope for it. <laughs> well, on that note, we actually have to wrap up, surprisingly. Mm -hmm. We just we burned through our time. So, Jonathan, if people wanted to yep. find you online or whatever, yeah. whatever you would want to tell people that they, they should know, whatever the heck it may be, what right. would you like to say right now? Well, clearly the most important place you can find me is as one of the hosts of Podcast Without Pretense, along with Aya Zaktar and Eric Sandine, where we tackle some of the deepest philosophical conundrums that have ever been posed in the history of humanity in the form of bad movies on Netflix. That is very true. That's what we do there. Um, yeah. So if you want to find ways to irritate yourself, uh, listen to, <laughs> either watch, either watch the movies we pick or listen to what we're going to say about them. Cause usually the, I believe our commentary is much more interesting than some of the movies we've seen. You oh. might also notice a distinct lack of empathy from me when I start talking about those movies. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Um, and by the way, if you guys are like, hey, that was not enough Jonathan Strickland and insights on this. We've actually done a previous interview. We went into a lot of stuff in that uh, other episode. And you can find the archives of that at gfqnetwork.com. So we've got lots of older episodes. We're going to keep trying to do this show more and more often as I'm in Queens right now, which is crazy. I mean, imagine that. That's like that's like Jonathan being in, a, in like Georgia. That's yeah. It'd be like if I were in Augusta instead of Atlanta. It's madness. Mm, but I'm from crazy. Queens, sort of. Anyway. I, well, yeah, anyway. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, I think that does it for us. So if you want more from us, gfqnetwork.com. If you want less of us, don't go to gfqnetwork.com. Uh, I'm on Twitter. I'm at IS. Jonathan, where are you again? At John Strickland. J-O-N. J-O-N. S-T-R-R. Yeah. R I C K. Sorry. L A N D. Yeah. Very easy name. He's very, very yes. privileged. It's Jonathan Strickland. He's a white male yeah, with am. a very easy name. I'm Aya Zaktar, and this has been Quest for Peace. Good luck, everybody. Kind of a guy from Queens. Well, I grew up in Queens. I'm from, I was born in Brooklyn. Yeah, you're made in Brooklyn, but you're a guy from Queens. You're a guy. I'm a guy from Queens. No matter how much you try Brooklyn, to deny it. You're a guy from Queens. I'm being yelled at. I'm being told I'm from Queens. If I ever visit, I should just introduce myself as a guy in Queens. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jonathan, thank you so much for being on again. Thank you, man. All right. Bye. See you hope, the rest of your, hope the rest of your day. Bye. <laughs> Coming up next is Tim Stevens of CNET. And prior to that, Engadget, and you've probably seen him on CBS News and all kinds of stuff. So I'm going to be back in like two minutes.